what if you could reduce the amount of weight that you're using in the weight room or the wattage level on your bike trainer to get the same or better results? I know. It sounded like science fiction to me when I was first introduced to the idea of blood flow restriction training. But we looked in the evidence, and this is the real deal. Our guest today is Joseph Marcus, founder of Vault, the most respected name in blood flow restriction training. And he walks us through this fascinating option that is research-based, not only for surgery and rehab settings, but also for athletes looking to get faster and stronger. Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and this one literally came out of left field for me. But th- this, is, this is the real deal, and you'll be glad you tuned in. On the coaching front, if you're looking to pursue your health and wellness coaching certification, including the MBHWC National Board Certification if desired, your next opportunity is June 5th and 6th. And this one started filling even before we closed out our March program. So if this is important to you and that time frame works, don't wait to check it out. All the details are available at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com or feel free to reach out to us anytime and we're happy to answer all your questions. Email is results at CatalystCoachingInstitute.com. Now let's tune into the intriguing insights of Joseph Marcus and the opportunities that exist with blood flow restriction training on the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast. All right, Joseph Marcus, thank you for joining us, buddy. This is, uh, this is going to be an intriguing conversation. I appreciate you making time for it. Now, nah, cheese, Brad. Looking forward to it. So let's set the stage a little bit, because as I mentioned to you when we were talking beforehand, a lot of folks are like, wait, blood flow restriction training? I don't even know what that is. I, I did some research leading to this, obviously, but what is it? How's it used, and how long has it been in the, and we'll use mainstream a little bit soft here today, but talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, so um, the method of blood flow restriction training dates back to the very late 1960s uh, with its development in Japan. When it became uh, popular or more mainstream in Japan in the early 1990s, in the West, in the, in the early 2000s, when it sort of gained more notoriety and use in the literature, some first exposure, but then also clinically uh, with sporting teams and uh, practitioners using it for rehabilitation mostly. But the prominence of blood flow restriction training over the last five years has gained momentum dramatically. Yeah, it um, sounds like if, it. Yeah, because if you can't engage in high load training because of injury or being load compromised, there's no real good second option. So right. BFR lends that lends that sort of um, applicability as being a good second option to high load training. So tell us a little bit more. What I know what it is just because I've, I've looked at some of the videos and that kind of thing. But for the person that's listening to this on a podcast and they're like, what? I mean, you're, you're essentially restricting the blood flow to some of the major muscle groups as you're working them. Uh, give, give us a little visual of that so people understand what we're talking about. Yeah, so um, blood flow restriction training is um, the application of a tourniquet-like device uh, applied to the upper limbs. So for the upper body, it would be the most proximal uh, humerus area. So the deltoid, tuberosity is the landmark you're looking for. And for the legs, it would be the um, basically inferior to the inguinal flow, which basically is high up on the thigh as possible. So you have the application of um, tourniquet devices on the limbs in combination with uh, exercise, uh, typically low load exercise, so around 30% of um, the previous one RM. And what that does, so the basically the addition of uh, the restriction bands or the blood flow restriction causes the muscle to fatigue at a much lower threshold than typically that, that would happen. So, and that fatigue is what is uh, instrumental in causing the positive adaptation. So say uh, low because low load training isn't ineffective and high load training is very effective but basically it's training to failure so 10 rm is 10 repetition max so the amount of weight you can lift 10 times so theoretically you can't lift an 11th rep because you failed right. 10 so that's why uh high load training typically is very effective because it's, it's psychologically physically very difficult but psychologically you're lifting five reps versus lifting this, uh, a lighter weight five, say 50 times or 100 times. It takes a lot more uh, psychological energy and also uh, uh, it takes a longer time as well. So that's why load load training isn't typically prescribed um, and typ- typically well tolerated by people in, in, a, in a rehabilitation setting or athletes trying to gain a performance edge because it's difficult to uh, implement and uh, difficult to basically progress because you're, you're training at so, at so many reps and doing so many sets. So BFR training decreases the amount of reps required to reach failure. So say 
Um, without uh, BF, uh, the application of blood flow restriction, you're, you'd need 50 reps to reach failure with a low, a low weight, say 20% you want one RM or whatever, whatever whatever it may be. With BFR, you reduce the amount of reps required, so you, you fail much more quickly um, and you get a lot more benefits in a shorter period of time depending on the previous level of, of your previous level of fitness. If you're quite detrained, you would get a much more pr- uh, pronounced um, uh, response. But if you're quite trained, the response might be a little bit diminished. Okay. And just for the folks listening that said, wait a minute, did he say a tourniquet? Yeah, and yeah, that, it, for those of you listening and not, not, you know, and you're not pulling this up online or something, it literally is like a tourniquet at the top of the, kind of where the biceps drop back into the deltoids and then at the top of the, the quadriceps. So Can you talk us through some of the, just throw out a study or two on this. I know there's a ton of research on this because I dug in before we chatted, but folks listening are going, wait, you're telling me put a tourniquet on my arm and that's going to give me an advantage either in rehab or as an athlete. Give us a couple of examples if you could. Yeah. uh, Quite quite an interesting example from two years ago, no, three years ago, now 2018 was with um, elite powerlifters. Basically, uh, with, a, with, with a power lifter, you assume that they're at their threshold of uh, muscular development, mm-hmm. um, as you would imagine with strength training. But they, um, so this was a study by Braun, and, and yeah, it was basically with national level power lifters, application of blood flow restriction training in addition to the, a six week training block. Um, and then the, the interesting thing about this study, it was not even um, concurrent, basically, sessions. It was, it was sort of separated by a rest period in between. So, so it was two one-week blocks of BFR training, and it led to so um, the strength. There was no, and at the end of the uh, intervention period of um, six and a half weeks, that the, the, they didn't have an improvement in um, strength because you would assume sure after they're already there threshold of strength, right. but they had an improvement in um uh, quite an improvement in muscle size, which is quite interesting in, in that study as well. So with, with um uh, sort of an elite, elite sporting sort of athletes can still get a performance benefit from lifting say 30 percent their one rm so that was quite an interesting study which came out with elite sports in terms of more sedentary populations or whatnot i think that's probably where the uh, bulk of the sort of benefits sure. can be seen is the fact that like it seemingly leads to comparative results one study from 2012 by Lorento was looking at um Again, physically active um, males, so not elite the elite athletes, but still physically active males. And one was doing high load training, so they were looking at doing eighty percent their um, uh, one rep max. So I think the traditional sort of three by eight rep scheme, and this was full body uh, uh, knee extension uh, exercise, and then also then the BFR group was looking at training with twenty percent their one RM, and it was more of a high rep sort of three sets of fifteen or so eight weeks so they were doing two sessions a week the i think probably looking at close to a 40 percent improvement in the strength one rm strength at the end of the intervention period wow. and, and probably around a six percent improvement hypertrophy and the, and the same for um the high intensity group as well but the the the, the, the usefulness is in that particular scenario was one group was lifting 80 percent their one rep max and the other group was lifting sort of 20 percent their one rep max so you've just reduced 60% of the load necessary to sort of see equivalent equivalent responses in strength and hypertrophy. So again, and I think that's probably um, the usefulness of BFR training would be the decrease in sort of joint stresses required to achieve results. And I think the results are more profound with sort of the, the more detrained you are. So if you're a highly trained athlete, you may get some benefits from at the addition of blood flow restriction training. But if you're returning from an injury, if you're elderly, uh, if you're detrained, I think that's where you get a much more pronounced exercise effect. Well, and, and as you were saying that, I'm thinking exactly what you just said, the, the elderly opportunity here, if you've got a 70 year old that's wanting to stay fit, but doesn't want to be sitting there throwing 200 pounds on to, to squat or, you know, bench press or something like that. Any safety considerations here? Has, has there been anything out there of, well, you know, you need to be, obviously you can't tighten it too much, but any guidance along those lines for people that are saying, I need to check this out. Just like ex- generally with exercise prescription, there is contraindications to doing blood flow restriction training, um, which would be similar contraindications to doing exercise training just more generally. 
basically immediate red flags which come to mind with say self safety concerns which probably most people have in, in their mind when they think about tourniquets and whatnot would be uh, dvts or or, or, or the <laughs> venous pump embolisms would be number one uh, history of any sort of um uh, hypercoagulability or like blood clotting disorders and then uh, lymphedema would be something else to flag active cancer and peripheral neuropathy or diabetes would be sort of immediate contraindications or at least warrant medical follow-up just to investigate sort of because I, I think ultimately with any modality it's safety is the balance so the definition of safety is the balance between uh, risk and reward exactly so i think yeah so i think nothing's inherently safe it's just the risks uh, rewards are outweighed by the risks so but in some circumstances the risks may be higher than the rewards and then maybe you would you don't complete that modality so I think it's the, uh, up to the individual to determine um, the suitability of those things, but basically understanding there is some contraindications and risks, but th- there is a, a multitude of rewards available, but whether that's on a case-by-case worth it, a case-by-case basis worth it to the individual. Okay, good. So endurance training versus strength training, is there a value for, let's say, a endurance, a marathon runner, a triathlete, anything? Because when I think, okay, in the first study, the elites had hypertrophy, so that's just adding weight. So that the endurance athlete doesn't want that unless there's strength that goes with it. Have have there been any studies done that you're aware of that benefited the the marathon or the, the ten thousand meter runners, the the track athletes, et cetera, outside of say a hundred meter runner? Yeah, there, there hasn't been so much that, that I've read anyway. So much to look at, sort of the application in particular uh, endurance sports of that nature, there's definitely um, aerobic benefits that can be achieved with BFR training, just generally with the application of blood flow restriction and cardiovascular exercise. So in terms of what that looks like, the protocols generally, so say for strength training, they're looking at the application of uh, four sets of of an exercise with 50% restriction of blood, and then that's sort of the strength protocols. And for improvements in sort of VO2 max or aerobic uh, improvements, the application is about 40 to 50% of the, v, of, the, of the current VO2 max or using heart rate reserve as the percentage to train at, so 40 to 50% of that value. And just in, engaging in um, low load aerobic exercise can lead to uh, improvements in VO2 max in, 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 in individuals. There, there wouldn't be a multitude of studies Looking at, but there's quite some emerging literature looking at, at, the, at the aerobic benefits of blood flow restriction. And yeah, there's one study which comes to mind by Abe in 2010, which is basically the addition of blood flow restriction to low load uh, cycling, three days a week, 15 minute sessions. And they compared that to free flow exercise for 45 minutes for, for the same three to three sessions sessions a week for three weeks the free flow exercise um, training at 40 percent of their vo2 max had no improvements or very little improvements in um, muscle strength and vo2 max but then the bfr group had i've I've just pulled it up now so they training at 40 percent their vo2 max for 15 minutes three times a week for three weeks they improved quadricep muscle size by 3.4 percent quadricep strength by seven and a half percent vo2 max by six and a half percent um, and that was their training at 40% of, of their VO2 max for 15 minutes. So I think Interesting. In, that, in that example, um, it lends itself to some interesting applications in terms of uh, endurance athletes, whatever it may be, 5,000 meters or 10,000 meters or ultra, it would be, be difficult to, to determine. But the interesting thing is the utilization, basically the, I imagine the, the fitness of the muscle to utilize energy is improved with exercise training just generally. And I think blood flow restriction training improves the ability of the muscle to use and utilize um, ex- uh, energy much more uh, efficiently, the same way as, uh, as exercise training does generally. So I think in terms of improving aerobic performance in that respect, I think that would be limited in terms of uh, as you get further and further away to more of the, of the aerobic system, then the, cardio, uh, the cardiopulmonary system yeah. becomes more of a driving force. So I think as the distance increases, maybe the utility of BFR training decreases in terms of that in that athlete. But for say, yeah, particularly for a detrained athlete, the application of BFR training to improve aerobic fitness would be a, a, a good utilization because it just generally improves the muscle function and the ability to utilize energy. So that would then allow for a higher level of cardiac output. But say someone who's very trained, then it might be 
the results of BFR trend will be uh, diminishing as well. Yes, okay. You really, really get my attention now. This is interesting. So would they actually run with these on their quadriceps or does that only work with cycling because you've got a little bit more separation? What Have, have, you, have you seen folks using yeah. it in running? That hasn't been, that I haven't seen running, uh, but definitely uh, sprint walking intervals and cycling and rowing up other exercises, which are, and, and um, there, were, there was one study, which I can recall was with sprinting. So, but, but they were, but they were okay. running at reduced rate. It weren't necessarily sprinting. I think they were training at, say, it may have been sort of 50% of max sort of speed. I'll, I'll have to pull that up. But because the addition of blood flow restriction, Things quite interesting in terms of the applications in the space of more performance. And I think that's yeah. that, that, that's a space which could probably could do a little bit more deep diving into because strength and hypertrophy can be sort of studied quite easily in the lab. I imagine, or I think the, the, the higher level sort of performance aspects. I think there's, yeah, there, there was some studies looking at futsal and, and at the application of blood flow restriction training in, into session, and there were some interesting results with that. But in terms of uh, uh, elite sports or prolonged aerobic activities, I, I can't recall okay. doing any studies. So another question down this path. So when you think of a, a triathlete or, or an endurance athlete, one of the problems is fitting everything into your life. So if you have a a, you know, I don't know, a tempo ride day where you're really hitting hard on the bike. Then you go out to work out in the, the gym and, and you're just like, you're cooked. Like, there's just nothing there. I'm imagining that you're saying, okay, you do the hard bike workout and then you, you do the BFR. And now, even though you're tired going into the weight workout, you can still get benefits. Even though your body's not ready to do the, you know, one rep max or even five rep max, but we can drop that down Am I hearing that right? Is that is that the potential you're yeah. talking about? For the question which comes up quite often is basically the application because the, 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 there's no doubt that BFI training is a useful modality, but use a case in terms of how, when, and why you mm-hmm. use BFI is sort of a little bit unknown at the moment. So people know it's a useful modality, but then how do you utilize it to get the most effect? And I think having discussions sort of along those lines over the years, I think, as you mentioned, for a apparently healthy athlete who has no no other injuries or whatnot the application of bfr probably would be a user case as you mentioned so if they're psychologically fatigued if they're physically fatigued and the idea of doing a second session in a day with heavy resistance training isn't uh possible and they and, and then still being able to get a stimulus into that day with a low load session which then will offer uh, results which are more profound than low load training. I think that's a, a quite a um, could be a quite a useful application of BFR training. Would be the fact that if you went out for a ten kilometer run and you were quite central, your central nervous system was quite taxed, and you were in the idea of doing sort of heavy resistance training wasn't possible. The, the application of BFR training to a low load session um, would be a, a, a good user case, I would say, mm. in terms of uh, that application, just to get in that volume of training without exerting um, without sort of the additional physical stress because you are training with 20 to 30 percent of your one rep max right. it is bfr training isn't isn't easy but in terms of uh, met, the metabolic effect because you get so much because basically so how the bfr training works is when you apply the cuffs to the upper arms or legs arterial flow from the heart is underneath high pressure so it goes into the limbs and then basically how blood flow works is the veins then bring the blood back to the heart, which are underneath lower pressure. And with blood flow restriction training, you're sort of target, you, you, you want to be more specifically targeting the venous return back to the heart, which is underneath lower pressure, but you are partially restricting the uh, oxygenated blood into the limb. But so because there's blood always going um, uh, into the into the limb, you get that blood full, pooling effect of blood not being able to come out. And that's what causes the... Um, basically muscle to fatigue. So you get that muscle burn feeling. So it's gotcha. not, um, the exercise is not like it's easy, uh, but, but, but it's not as you, once the cuff comes off, you don't feel that heavy aching of having done okay. a five by five squat session or whatnot, right. which you get typically. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting. Very, 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 very transient in terms of the response in terms of it's very difficult when the cuffs are on and you're exercising, but once the cuffs come off within three to five minutes, you've got free Your recovery is flow and, you, and, you, and, you, and you feel quite recovered. Okay. So what if the reverse is done then instead of, you know, I, I'm more endurance focused, so I would do the bike first and then go do the gym. But, but with this, it sounds like, yeah, hit the weight room, do this because as soon as you take those things off, you're going to be fine. Now you can hop on the bike and do your thing. Yeah. Is that more? 
I would say you'd you emphasize what was most important to the athlete, but that sounds like a because you won't. I, I don't imagine if anything. Yeah, there's, there was one study which came out, um, which is quite interesting. It, it, it hasn't got a, a full a full ground base. Uh, a, a, there's not a, a multitude of studies to support it just at the moment, but it was looking at the the application of blood flow restriction with uh, a one exercise in, in that study. It was looking at the, a dynamic lunge, split squat exercise, and application of blood flow restriction training doing I think it was four sets of 12 of a lunge exercise with blood flow restriction cuffs on the legs and immediately taking the cuffs uh, off and then completing a jump exercise and the jump the, the flight time was improved by 4.9 percent immediately afterwards so there was a neuromuscular patterning kind of uh, right. potentiation occurring um, which improved the physical outcome of jumping so th- that's it, I find that interesting in terms of the because typically for neuromuscular uh, activation you're training with heavy weights or, or doing some sort of active, some sort of strenuous active drill. So the application of BFR, some body weight squats, and then saying that improves a physical outcome like um, uh, jumping, then then there might be some use of it uh, pre, say, say a pre some sort of physical drill or activity where BFR could be a useful addition. So in that user case, say if the athlete was doing a weight session with BFR and then went to the cycle, I'm curious to know sort of how their session would go. I would say that, that, that just anecdotal. I haven't sort of read that, but I wouldn't imagine they'd be too um, taxed in terms of um, compromising this um, performance on the bike. Okay. But that would be something to be explored. And then I've read about potential benefits on recovery days. What, what are your recommendations in terms of athletes or individuals using it as a recovery tool to, to make that in-between day allow them to do get more results, but not feel the fatigue that sets up the following day as a disaster day. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, in terms of the use of BFR training as, as a sort of active um, recovery tool, I would say in terms of um, there wouldn't be too, much, too many studies uh, looking at basically uh, it improving recovery, but in terms of how it could improve scheduling of exercise sessions yeah. would be the fact what we just discussed in terms of what the exercise dose is very low in terms of what's being exerted upon the joints and ligaments that you can still get an exercise session in between heavy train sessions. Right. So I yeah, it's not improving your recovery. It's just allowing you to do that workout with less need for recovery. Exactly. I would say that unless um, strain and muscle damage occurring, so you're not getting the complete sort of uh, tearing of right. muscle fibers and then excessive joint stress and the, and the taxing system of your on the central nervous system. Yeah, so I, I'd say because it works more metabolically as opposed to mechanically. So the mechanical stress of heavy weights isn't there. Right. And the system of um, uh, of metabolic fatigue can be cleared by the body quite effectively after the tourniquet has been removed. So it's, it's very much more a transient um, response. Interesting. So in, in athletic po- in athletic populations, they've they've, they've, they've looked at doing BFR training uh, daily. Yeah. So I think six days in a row in, in one study. Um, and that led to an improvement. Um, and I think that was yeah, of power and strength. So in terms of um, versus high load training, it seems to be well tolerated in, in that respect. But it, just like anything, though, it, it still is an additional stimulus. And if an athlete who is conscious of their load, it, they still have to be mindful of where that sits into their training schedule. Right. right. So do we need to, with that said, do we need to cycle on and off? Do you need to use BFR for a month and then, not for two weeks and then come back or, or what do you recommend there? And I know not everything's established with complete, you know, detailed research, but what are your recommendations? Yeah. In terms of um, cycling through BFR, there'll be no reason to cycle on and off. Um, you're not going to get, in terms of uh, basically if you're, not, if you're not using it on, on too many non-consecutive, on, on too many consecutive days, so you're having, you're, you're applying basically the same principles of exercise prescription. So, uh, one day on, one day off, maybe alternating between muscle groups maybe, and alternating between um, aerobic and resistance training as well, you'd be okay to implement BF, BFR on the, on, on the long term. And then, yeah, basically the only thing you, you, you'd, be do, you'd do is every two weeks or so, uh, reestablish your values for the pressure that you're using and get another baseline and continue exercising again. And, and in so, terms of those values and the, the, the pressure you're the founder of the air bands. Do the air bands do that for you? Is there any, uh, I'm thinking the athlete that's working out by themselves, you know, athletes, we can be a little psychotic sometimes like, Oh, I'll just go harder. Yeah, Are there yeah. some things that they need to be aware of, of, or does the air band or other devices like it protect you from being an idiot? 
Yeah, th- that's probably the main point to emphasize with blood flow restriction training is because the, the pressure used are submaximal because you're still wanting uh, to, uh, oxygenated blood sure. to the limb, which which makes the, uh, which that, that that's what adds the um, makes it effective. It's the fact that there is oxygen and makes it safe as well. The fact that there's oxygenated blood entering the limb, and you're only sort of specifically hopefully targeting the deoxygenated blood, so the pressures are submaximal. So that value um, is traditionally called arterial occlusion pressure also referred to as occlusion pressure, which is basically the amount of pressure required to cut off blood flow distal to the application of a tourniquet. With the, um, uh, some devices don't do that and the application of a distal probe is required. So say for the uh, more manual devices, the cuff goes on, a distal probe is applied to the radial artery, um, the cuff is pumped up, and at the point where the radial artery is absent, is that determined to be your occlusion uh, pressure? And then you exercise at 50% of that value. So say if that was 150, your BFR pressure would be 75. And the idea there is it's high enough to target a venous flow back. So you, you've, you've diminished venous flow, but it's low enough to allow arterial flow into the limb. So that's what helps with the cell swelling and gets causes all the um, engor- blood engorgement, then causes the fatigue in the muscle, and that, co- that triggers some pathways to um, improve strength and hypertrophy. So that, that's basically submaximal would be what you're after. And with air bands, they have a mapped algorithm where they uh, basically a, a sensor which uh, determines sort of the blood pressure, uh, the blood values to be used, and gives you that gives the athlete that value automatically. So without the necessity for a distal probe. So the athlete that's like, oh, I'm going to go hard. That's not a thing. Like the the machine keeps you from being an idiot, basically. Yeah, the machine makes recommendations to use basically values uh, presented to you, and and then there's prefixed values of uh, percentages to use. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I would say it, it's strongly encouraged that you don't succeed. Though basically, fifty percent is okay. generally a benchmark to be training around with BFR training and. And there's no reason to go any sort of higher than that unless you've been advised um, otherwise or, or have um, or are working with a specific goal. So for strength and hypertrophy, 50% of that value seems to be a very um, good place to be training at of the limb occlusion pressure. Uh, in some studies, they've used higher pressures, but they're trying to achieve different results. Okay. So for strength and hypertrophy, endurance would be 50%. But say if you're using BFR training to cause uh, modulation of pain responses in a limb. So say someone who's had a recent knee, uh, has anterior knee pain, that they've done some studies with application of uh, 80% uh, of, of, of the pressure value to reduce uh, uh, pain acutely. Right. That seems to be quite promising in, in, in pain reduction. And also in the absence of exercise, and you're just trying to use BFR training passively, prevent muscle loss, again, using 100% has been shown in some studies to be an effective way of reducing muscle atrophy with, in, in, without the presence of exercise. But the idea, I imagine, like how I visualize it is kind of like a seesaw. So if mechanical stress is very high, then you need very little uh, BFR. So if, you, if, if the athlete can train, uh, if, if the athlete is training very heavy, then they don't need any BFR. Sure. If, if the load is 50%, then, 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 maybe they, then maybe they can use a little bit of BFR to get an additional stimulus. And if the load is very little, maybe they use a lot of BFR to get the stimulus. So it's kind of like it works inverse. So we've been talking so you, mainly about athletes, but the, you, you touched on the rehab setting there. Can you talk us through how it's been used there? Is it primarily what knee surgery, shoulder surgery, elbow? What, what are some of the most common uses in the rehab setting for the BFR? Because yeah. everything you've told us would fit for the rehab setting, but, but where are you seeing this used the most? Yeah, the, the worst wide, wide adoption has been uh, post-operative ACLs has been um, because I think with post-operative ACLs, there's, there's such a small window where you can gain a lot yeah. of, um, of benefit by not cause, uh, preventing atrophy. So I think 48 months post-operative, a lot, most ACL patients still experience knee pain, which is directly associated with quadricep strength. Mm-hmm. Because quadricep strength is the number one predictor of, of outcomes sure. post up. Yeah, Definitely. so if you, if, you, if you can prevent um, the loss of uh, quadricep strength postoperatively, immediately, then you've just accelerated the rehabilitation program because if you haven't lost muscle strength, you don't have to regain it. So right. that, that's why BFR in that acute period um, seems to be very widely used by elite sporting teams, uh, particularly in the US. I, I would say 
who have been on the forefront of, of, of um, utilizing blood flow restriction training post-operatively in, a, in, in an elite sporting setting. I would say the majority of, of our professional teams in the US would be using blood flow restriction training um, in some way, but most likely post-operatively, most likely with ACLs. Um, Achilles, biceps, yeah, the, the, elbow. Yeah, there'd the, the be no reason why um, the application of BFR for um, the same injuries, say it's an Achilles, yeah. whether it's repair, whether it's on a collateral repair, whatever the condition may be, if you can benefit from uh, the maintenance of muscle mass and, and the improvement of strength, BFR training. And, 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 if you, if you, and then if you're worried about the graft or the surgical site being compromised by high loads, BFR seems to right. be very... Solves uh, that. A very, very, very good option. And particularly if you can use BFR in multiple ways. So the roadmap for, say, using blood flow restriction training, say if you used a, a, an ACL as an example, the athlete uh, ruptured their ACL. Uh, typically, if they've, they've ruptured their ACL, they've also then damaged their medial collateral ligament and also the meniscus. So they've done a lot of um, uh, damage to their knee. So then they may be not that ambulatory. So, and typically, I think they wait four weeks or so right. uh, between injury and surgery to operate on. But the application of be a sort of post-injury, pre-surgery, to maintain or improve quadricep mass as much as we can leading into the surgery um, would be a, a, a good option. And then the study has looked at applying uh, blood flow restriction training. I think it was as little as uh, day two post-operative. Wow. For the, a- ACL and they used it for day two to day 14. And in that study, it, it hasn't, again, it hasn't been super, uh, super widely researched in terms of its ability to prevent uh, muscle loss. It's, it's quoting a, hand, a handful of studies, but um, it, Takarana, I think it was 2000, looked at um, yeah, a 50% reduction in atrophy in the quadriceps, uh, I think it's a cross sectional area of, of the leg. The application of blood flow restriction uh, at very high pressures. Um, again, not su- not widely replicated, but again, an interesting study to look at. But the combination of um, different mod- layering modalities, I think the coupling blood flow restriction with sort of knee exercises, right. which can be done passively in bed, uh, coupling of blood flow restriction training with stimulation, that then seem to be promising things to improve the effectiveness of the other modalities. But say, but say for a um, ACL, so you, you can use it preoperatively, you can use it immediately postoperatively, p- passively, and then once able, maybe the addition of blood flow restriction plus cycling to again improve um, quadricep mass and cardiovascular fitness, and then the addition of blood flow restriction training just to closed chain, open chain exercises. So it, it sort of gets you to the point where you can begin uh, more strenuous uh, rehabilitation exercises, but without having as much downtime in between injury and high, uh, more medium to high road training. Right, right. Wow. That seems to be um, how the elite sporting teams are using it, basically in, in those acute periods where load is an issue and they can bridge the gap between no training to high training. Okay. Uh, okay, so a lot of our listeners are health and wellness coaches, so it's outside of our scope of practice to say, you should try this. But as we continue to see this more and more, clients are going to be asking about it. What are some of the key questions the coach should ask the client to clarify whether maybe it is something they should look into or not? I mean, is this something, you know what, it's for pretty much everybody, post-rehab, post-injury, pre-surgery, athletes. Is there anything they should be looking for where the person kind of gives them a red flag that, eh, better not talk about this much? Yeah, I'd say um, the, the, the uh, client's, uh, preparedness for exercise generally. So if they ha- have had much experience with resistance training, just mm-hmm. uh, DOMS in particular, mm-hmm. muscle pain, they, they're very. Um, like if you if you didn't if you didn't advise someone that that, that they're going to experience muscle pain or DOMS pr- post exercise, and DOMS is delayed onset muscle soreness. Everybody, just <laughs> for the rest of the folks. Yeah. And then if, 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 if and then he's took them to a strenuous exercise session two days after or a day after, they they might think something's very wrong. Right. I imagine. So I think with blood flow restriction and training, just letting them know that it's what they experience of muscle tightness, engorgement, transient uh, discomfort is very normal. During the exercise. To, during the exercise and be able to differentiate between uh, normal symptoms and bad symptoms. So bad symptoms would be changes in uh, temperature of the skin, so cold, hot, uh, d- d- so inability to determine temperature of the skin because that means you've affected the nerve too much. Pins and needles would be, would be one. 
and um, it's kind of like a, like any sort of sharp shooting pains. So being able to, to discern between those two sort of okay um, reactions and, and not okay reactions to the blood flow restriction, uh, people's sort of uh, ability, robustness to withstand sort of discomfort as well. So if someone doesn't typically like resistance training anyways, and then you're not only getting to do resistance training, you're also then getting to do resistance training underneath an additional stimuli. But just generally, there, there wouldn't be beyond uh, medical red flags in terms of contraindications. Sure. I would say BFR training would be useful for most populations, uh, barring any sort of uh, explicit contraindications. Because I think that it's uh, in terms of pain, it's not uncomfortable. It's just it's not painful. It's just relatively uncomfortable. Right. But you sort of get used to the discomfort sure. after after a few sessions. Right. Um, and I think there would there wouldn't be in terms of broaching it with a, with a client or athlete. If an athlete would benefit from uh, expedited exercise sessions uh, because of time inefficiencies, yeah. then BFR would be useful. An example was recently with the COVID situation was gyms closures, right? right. Um, and we had a number of clients, uh, elite sporting team clients, cured some, um, some, some, some blood flow restriction cuffs to train in their hotel rooms because they didn't have access to uh, high loads of their machines. Right. So it, just improve, trying to improve the effectiveness of body weight exercises, trying to improve the effectiveness of, um, of low resistance exercise tubing, um, blood flow restriction could be useful in that sort of remote exercise setting. So if you have mm. a, a client and you're training them remotely, right. then take, taking some BFR cuffs with you could be very useful. So that, that could be a useful strategy for an athlete who doesn't like resistance training. BFR could be a useful addition because a lot of those football players or soccer players don't like doing resistance training and they like training on the pitch. So BFR training in the addition of body weight exercises or sideline exercises could be a good way of introducing load mm. and preventing sort of improving robustness in the athlete but without having them get them in the gym. That would be the user cases in terms of why BFR may be useful in sort of an athletic setting. But I would say just generally there wouldn't be too many populations which would, which would, which would say it's not effective for understanding how, when, and why you're using it. And using it with sort of intent. So if you're if you have an athlete who has lower back pain, and you're saying, okay, yeah, I can't get him to squat, um, he's going to miss an exit squatting session, but we can put some BFR coughs on him and get him to do some body weight squats. At least that way, he's still getting his um, yeah. movement pattern of a squat, movement pattern of a squat in. But we're not, and we're improving his glute strength, we're improving his quad strength, but we're not ag- exacerbating his lower back pain. Right. So that and that'd be a good addition to a blood, uh, blood flow restriction. If an athlete, like as you said, had a game, they were injured. But cause just generally after, say, a football game, after a big run, you're not injured, but you have niggling sort of ankle pain, yeah, yeah, yeah. elbow pain. Yeah, it's a little so niggles. The addition of, yeah, so the, the addition of BFR, the low load session afterwards to sort of stimulate some improvements in strength and hypertrophy but without the wear and tear, that could be a useful addition. And then also supplementing high load training. So... If you got an athlete to do five sessions of high load training a week, so 80% of their one RM, they're eventually going to get injured at some point, uh, just through general wear and tear. But yeah. if you supplement two or three of those sessions with BFR sessions, you're still getting in a, a high dose of stimulus, but you're, you're reducing the wear and tear on the athletes and the mileage on the athletes' joints. So I think that, that, that could be an interesting way of looking at it. So whether it's two high load sessions, two BFR sessions in a week, or whatever that might be. But I think um, it'd be good to hear from, because uh, currently BFR is quite interesting. It's very lab-based, as in like it, it, it was sort of born out of research. Sure. It was used uh, clinically, but then the user cases weren't super well-developed in terms of how a endurance athlete uses BFR, how a basketball player uses BFR, who's injured and not injured. Do we right. include it into the in-season use? Do we not include it in-season use? Does it replace high load training does a supplement high load training like i uh, still so i think um the user map is um, something which I, I, I look forward to when basically as it gets more widespread um strength, strength coaches using it with their athletes and figuring out oh hey if we use some bfr push-ups prior to a bench press bench press strength goes up yeah yeah or, 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 yeah, or yeah. whatever it may be or right. whatever it may be or, or the recovery people, days or yeah yeah or, or, or recovery days i think i've had some interesting conversation with some baseball coaches um, and strength and conditioning coaches working in baseball about how they use uh, utilize blood flow restriction training as sort of a, a flushing, uh, active recovery, muscle, stimu- uh, muscle um, uh, stimulation um, uh, modality pre-post pitching 
they get anecdotally getting results. And that thing's very interesting for me in terms of like um, uh, where the literature is going and its user cases are going. Yeah. Wow. Joseph, this is so fascinating. I, I, I knew you were going to wake me up to some things, but the, the utilization seems so widespread potentially. Uh, for folks that are wanting to hear more about air bands or, or they want to follow what you're doing or some of the research, what's the best way to keep track of you? What's, what's, the, best, what's the best way to tap into what you've got going? Yeah, so um, the, 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 the airbands.com, uh, airbandsbfr.com would be uh, a platform to reach. Um, we're very active on uh, Instagram uh, and it's, it's airbandsbfr uh, as well. Uh, and basically airbands BFR across all our platforms. Um, we, 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 we're mindful of the fact that um, education and uh, content is useful as well for a lot of uh, people. So we're trying to put out um, some research studies and uh, of things of that nature. So I think um, we're most active on Instagram, but again, the website and you can know, reach us directly via email as well, info at airbandsbfr.com. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I, I can be reached directly as well through that um, email channel. Perfect. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, happy to reach out in any, any way of it being used. But I think, I think it's, it's, still, it's still an emerging um, area. I think people, a lot of uh, high-level strength coaches are aware of BFR now. But again, and then I think the next sort of five years will be uh, people have gained confidence in using oh, BFR. Yeah, yeah. And things like this where people go, oh, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I say as people get, um, as utility gets more widespread, then the in individual user cases will increase and then people will research that and become um, right. quite pleased to uh, use BFR in more um, unique situations. Right. Well, I really appreciate you joining us. I know you're scheduled a little haywire sometimes and we're figuring out the time difference between Australia and the US, but thanks for making the work. Really appreciate it. Oh, geez, Brad. Thank you very much for your time, mate. Much appreciated. Wasn't that fascinating? Again, I get it. It sounds crazy. But the research backs it up, and I've tried it myself since we recorded this interview. Definitely something I'll be continuing to integrate into my own future training, and not just while I'm recovering from shoulder surgery, but long after that piece is in my rear view mirror. Thanks for tuning into the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. Next week's guest is an interview I've wanted to do for years. It's with Professor Timothy Noakes. Yes, the Timothy Noakes, who identified the central governor theory about why we slow down before our physiological reserves tap out. The same Timothy Noakes that was the first one to discover the problem with over, not under, hydration among endurance athletes. The same Timothy Noakes who penned the lore of running before running was really much of a thing. You will love this discussion with a true pioneer across so many fronts. As always, if you have any questions about pursuing a career as a health and wellness coach, we're happy to connect. Just drop us a note to results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com or you can access a library of resources at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. Now it's time to be a catalyst on this journey of life. The chance to make a positive difference in the world, not by burning ourselves out, but instead by simultaneously improving our own lives along the way. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute. Make it a great rest of your week. And I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast, or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.